Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Envelope. I'm Mark Olson, and this week I'm talking to Coleman Domingo, who was recently nominated for an Emmy for his role on Euphoria. The show's been something of a youth sensation with its extreme depictions of sex, drugs, and drama among a group of high schoolers. Coleman plays Ali, sponsor to a struggling teenage drug addict named Rue. It's played by Zendaya. Yo, 60 days. No small feat. Thanks. Very moving share. Thank you. Can I ask you something? How'd you survive that OD? Coleman's character really is one of the few adult voices of reason on the show, a rare grown-up in the room. It's funny, Yvonne, does euphoria make you feel old? Oh my God, yes. But, you know, I still use the bitch, you better be joking gif, as if I'm part of the club, which probably isn't (laughs) making me any more cool with the kids, but I don't care. I still watch with fascination at, you know, this gritty rendering of the modern high school experience because Mine was mostly about trading posters of Backstreet Boys for NSYNC, but, you know, enough about me. I mean, Coleman is so dynamic on the show, the way his character navigates his own recovery and pain. And for folks who only know him from Euphoria or other recent screen roles, like in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Fear of the Walking Dead, or Zola, they may not know that he has a long career in the theater as a performer, director, and writer. Oh, yes, a true multi-hyphenate, which I definitely am not. Like, can you imagine if we started to produce this show, Mark? Like, we'd be so, or I'd be so bad at this. I won't speak for you. But um, I don't have the energy for that, but good for Coleman. (laughs) And, you know, he approaches everything he does with such verve and purpose and just a sense of life. You know, I don't often have this feeling during interviews, but I kind of just want to ask him for advice And I don't know if it's a holdover from his role on Euphoria, but he really does seem like someone who might have some answers. And and honestly, he really kind of delivered during our conversation. So let's get to it. For The Envelope, I'm Mark Olson. With me today is writer, director, performer, Coleman Domingo, who was recently nominated for an Emmy for his performance on Euphoria. Coleman, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, It's such a pleasure to be here, Mark. Thank you. And now congratulations on that Emmy nomination for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Drama Series. Did you do anything to celebrate on the, the day the nomination was announced? What did I do? I was actually uh, rapping uh, The Color Purple musical feature in Atlanta, Georgia. It was my last day. And um, I just, I watched the nominations when it happened. I actually shed a tear and that's not usually my style, but I felt like there was so much, I had so many people rallying for me. I felt like I was like, oh, I didn't want to let them down in a way. It feels, that's a strange thing to say, but I guess that's what happened. Well, the timing of that is incredible. I'd imagine that that made a day that would have already been emotional that much more so. It did. It just uh, felt like a a great culmination in many ways of many things. Um, And and the Color Purple musical feature took six months to film. So it was the longest film shoot I've ever been on. And it was arduous and um, it took everything we've got. And so it just felt like a nice release, honestly. And so I think that's why also why I cried a little bit. I felt like it was like, oh, I'm coming to a beginning of something and maybe an ending of something at the same time. And so I think your body just goes into (laughs) shock. And sometimes it's either tears or laughter that comes out. Mine was tears. Well, one of the things I always find so incredible in thinking about your career is that for people who just know you from your recent film and television work, you really do have this whole other life and career before that in the theater. What does it mean to you to see all of that work culminating in the way it has over the last few years? It's truly been meaningful because, uh, again, I started out in the theater, black box theaters in San Francisco, um, and then moved to the regional theater circuit and, you know, working as a regional theater actor for many years. And then eventually I was in New York and from there, from off Broadway to Broadway, uh, you name it. But I was just constantly just just doing the work. It really wasn't about accolades or anything. I, I actually never came into this industry actually with sort of lofty 
you know, ambition to be on Broadway or to have a TV show or films. I just wanted to do good work and be respected for it. And it was really about being a craftsman and being a part of this tradition of the theater. And so as my career just kept expanding into television spaces where I felt like it was really calling on the things that I did in the theater. So it felt like a, a great marriage, actually, and a great um, step. Because uh, for, for a long time, I, did, I didn't think television and film, at least television in particular, I think that there was no place for me. I didn't think there was a place for me for a long time because of the roles that were uh, presented. You know, in the theater, I was just doing Shakespeare and I was, you know, playing such incredible characters. Um, and I just thought that I wasn't going to be challenged in the television space until television started changing. I also think that television started changing because they were hiring more playwrights to write for television. So there we are, a marriage. So I found my place in television and in film. And it's been really, really, really beautiful. And then you you first worked with Euphoria creator Sam Levinson on the movie Assassination Nation. And I'm, I want to know... Did you know right away that that relationship with him was going to be as sort of important and, and ongoing as it has been? I want to say no, and I want to say yes at the same time. <laughs> because when I met him, I met him in the basement of some restaurant bar at Sundance. You know, you meet everybody at Sundance. And I was there for Nate Parker's film, Birth of a Nation, uh, that I, I starred in. And there were two guys standing downstairs who were just really lovely and kind of shy, but really talkative at the same time. And it was Sam Levinson and Jeremy L. Harris, his best friend. And so the three of us stood in a corner, and I swear we talked the entire time. I think we all really realized that we were very much cut from the same cloth, that we were, I think, you know, possibly like hyper-intelligent, hyper, you know, thoughtful human beings who can just be in a corner and engage with two people the entire night. Mm-hmm. That was our jam. So that's what we did. We, we actually had, a, um, had a, a bro date at Soho house in New York after that, uh, that beautiful meeting at, at Sundance. And we were both so nervous to meet up because we both really wanted to be friends. <laughs> it was so nerdy. We were like, I was really nervous. And he, he told his wife, Ashley, how nervous he was to meet me that he, he got himself sick a little bit. <laughs> And then we finally met up and we talked because we knew we, there was a brotherhood there. We didn't want to mm-hmm. mess it up. And so I know that that's what I was interested in, of someone who I loved his mind and his the things that he was thinking about and dreaming about creating. And then he first uh, wrote the role for me in Assassination Nation. And I thought, you know, there's certain artists that I've worked with that I say, you can, whatever you write, whatever you create, it can be small or large, I'll do it. You don't even have to tell me what it is. And Sam is one of those people because I like the way his mind works. So I just mm-hmm. trust him. So when he came to me with um, Ali and Euphoria, it was even presented as say, oh, he's a small part that grounds our main protagonist, Rue, played beautifully by Zendaya. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. But I didn't know that it would, you know, take off the way it has. I didn't know that at all. But I just I had a lot of trust and faith in Sam and what he was creating, not only for me, but for my, my peers. And then the, the role of Ali is based in part on Sam Levinson's own sponsor. And I'm just wondering, like, have you ever met that person or if you, what kind of conversations you had with Sam about the reality that that character comes from? I've had very simple conversations with Sam, but I think that he also, and I also believe that it's very important to not let it be specifically about his former sponsor. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's bigger than that. I think it's a nice jumping off point, but I think it required a lot more of research on my part and um, interrogation about the disease of addiction and really creating a man who is not perfect and someone who is trying to do good in the world because he's trying to sort of, I think, you know, redeem himself as well. I was using, and my wife wasn't having it. We were fighting every night. And it got physical. And uh, one night I looked over and I see my two little girls watching. And I thought, here I am, a grown man with two girls, and they just watched me hit their mom in the face. I spent 30 years of my life thinking of how to kill my dad for doing the same shit I just did to that mom. 
So we've had some great conversations about some very simple things. The fact that he drove a truck or that he loved Miles Davis, the way he sort of had a little swagger. Uh, but that's about it. But then I think my Ali comes from men that I know personally. Mm -hmm. Is there anything specific you can say? Like what's something about Ali that you feel like you've drawn from someone you know? When I look at myself as Ali, and I wonder if he would agree, because I have not asked him. I know that he loves the character of Ali, but I see my older brother, Rick. Hmm. My older brother, Rick, is a barber. He's a painter. He's a really beautiful human being, and I've always admired him. He always had a great sense of style. And my brother, he's been in you know the armed forces. He's done a couple tours of Iraq. And I think that he's somebody who has, you know, he's a very sort of like what I like to say, an ordinary man who does extraordinary things. And he doesn't, he's not even aware of it. I don't think it's very conscious of him. I think he's had his own um, battles with uh, possibly with alcohol, to be honest. I know that that's always been a struggle for him. And he swings one way or the other. He either goes very much into fitness and health or he goes very much strongly into religion and interrogating, you know, different practices. Or sometimes he, he will sink into alcohol. And but he but he's also somebody who also knows how to stop in a way. Like he knows he's conscious enough in that way. So mm-hmm. I think he's a he's a, someone who understands what is happening and then he can put a stop to it when he wants to. But he also has at times needed some support. Uh, and we give him support as a family. And he also, he knows when it's time to go into a program. Um, So he's somebody I I know, I'm I'm sure I draw from in many ways, uh, because he's somebody who I love dearly. And I know I want the best for, and I know he wants the best for me. And he's my brother. With regards to uh, character Ali, you know, he's still kind of an enigma outside of being a sponsor for for Rue, the Zendaya's character. Do you have an idea in your head of like what the rest of his world is? Like what's the rest of a day for Ali like? <laughs> I, I do have some ideas. Sam has whispered a few ideas to me about season three and how we're going to continue to unpack Ali. Mm-hmm. I think the the greatest moment that we've had for Ali is in that very special episode that was at the end of 2020. Um with that famous diner scene. I guess it's mm-hmm. infamous now because it was 55 minutes of just dialogue. And uh, we got to know so much more about Ali and what he thinks, which I think is one of the most important things. We know what he thinks about society, about uh, activism, what uh, about history. So we get to know his mind. And then we get a, a glimpse into his private life when he takes a phone call outside and understand that he's got um, an estranged family and he's still paying for uh, many of his um, faulty decisions mm. of, uh, and his uh, disease of addiction. And it's, he's really carrying it. So we see, and now we're able to examine that as we, he walks back in and he's able to relate with Rue. We know what's underneath all of that and why it means so much to him to connect and sort of try to save this young woman. You have daughters, right? Mm-hmm. Who are they? Different places celebrating with the families. You see them often? Hmm. I've never declined an invitation. Wait, but haven't you been, like, clean for 20 years? Nah, nah. I was clean for seven years. So I think that there's going to be a lot more to unpack with Ali because, you know, we, we, we haven't seen what is his data. We don't know where does he live. Mm-hmm. Does he have a, a girlfriend? Is he dating? Um, how is he just out in the world walking down the street? Um, what does he like to eat? We know he likes to eat pancakes. We do know that much. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think back to the first scene with Ali and Rue where they meet at this NA meeting. She's clearly high at the at the meeting and – you know, he's like a little askance as to like what to do with this kid who's kind of wandered in. Some of those scenes that you have with her just have so much intensity to them. 
How do you prepare for the intensity of something like that, you know, that initial scene between the two of you or even some of the, the scenes in, in this most recent season? You know what? I believe that everyone has as much darkness as they do light. Hmm. And I believe that people make choices every day, whether to live in the light or let the darkness envelop them. In particular, there's the episode uh, this past season where uh, Rue and Ali really get into it. He sort of snatches her bag and, and he, you can see the darkness come out of his eyes. Excuse me? <laughs> when I sit across from you and tell you something about my life, you didn't get to use that shit against me. You cross that line again, we're done. You talk back right now, we're done. One more fucking disrespectful word out of your mouth and we're done. You hear me? Hey, you hear me? Or what, Ali? You hear me? What I love is that we've already set up. He's told the audience, I've been violent. I've been vicious. I've been high on crack. And you name it. And in that moment, I know that it was important for Sam and I for you to see a little bit of that, that darkness mm-hmm. of because she triggered him and put him in a place to actually bring out that darkness. She was being very manipulative in that moment. And I know that I wanted to let that darkness that also lives in Coleman. It also lives in Ali. It lives in all of us. You got to tap into that, whatever that is for you, mm-hmm. you know? So I think that you just have to fully go there, but you go there in a, in a way where, you know, you, you and your fellow actor, you 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 know, we we trust each other, Zendaya and I. I'm somebody who always touches after a scene and just say, "Are you okay? Was that okay?" We check in with each other, and then we go deeper. You know, she's a like, great. You know, you you understand the boundaries, and then you you trust and you go to the places that you need to go. I think that what Sam does, his whole crew, and Zendaya, there's such a level of trust and openness where you can be your most raw self and feel like you're supported and you're like, you're not going to fall. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I, I'm somebody who I will rehearse my own, my own work. I will uh, look at my objectives and my actions, and then I will let it be, just become available on set and be available. Let me be as honest as I can to this experience and let me get, keep my own self out of the way. So there's a bit of alchemy, I believe, that happens. I think something about it is kind of spiritual. I think um, it's definitely all inside of me. I've heard you say that you can spend upwards of 30 to 50 hours preparing for a single episode of Mm -hmm. the show. And I'm wondering if that's kind of your theater background and that kind of work. And that for people who maybe don't understand acting, and this would include myself, what goes into that time? What is what is the work that you're doing, you know, over those many hours to create one hour of, of television? Well, I'll tell you this. I am a nerd, and I like to research <laughs> everything. Anything that I do not know, that I'm curious about, that the script says I am, or there's a reference to um, a pair of sneakers or a, a, a street, I research everything, and I take lots of notes. And then... I actually, you know, I go through my script. I want to underline and understand the actions. What am I saying? What do I want? What happens if I don't get it? It's all this, you know, just all this work to understand what you're saying, the beats of a scene, um, how it lives in you. And so I rehearse that and rehearse it and rehearse it. For me, rehearsal is key. I come from the theater Mm -hmm. and I feel like rehearsal is all I have. So I can step on set and I can actually be free. I've actually had some discussions with some actors who felt like, oh, if I know too much, I, I, I don't trust that I'm going to be available. That's one way. It's a practice for me that I need in order to be free. I, I, I don't know how to just show up on set and be because I don't mm-hmm. think I have everything with me. I need to know so much and then be available to what I don't know. I think the trick is, especially with the character of Ali, he's such a everyman and sort of lays in the cut that I don't want you to see acting at all. Ali is someone that I wanted to just slip into your consciousness. He's a guy that you know. There's nothing about it to just feel performative in any way. 
I think if anything, he's the least performative character that I've played. So for me to do that, for me to arrive at that, I have to make many, many choices and um, have many, many um, sessions with myself and conversations and research so it can go away. So it can just feel like breath. I want you to feel like, oh, I know I've seen that guy on the bus. I've seen him. He goes and gets cigarettes around the corner at my bodega. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what has it been like for you over the course of the show now to see Zendaya develop in her role as Rue? That character and the performance she's giving really have grown over time. What has it been like for you to be a part of that process? For a young woman in this industry, uh, Zendaya has so much... Uh, of a grounded sense of self that I admire. And I think she pours that into her work. She's very authentic and she's very mm -hmm. real. She's, it's so funny because I, I almost can't put together in my mind the young woman that I see on the cover of magazines with the young woman that I know. But, you know, we talked about this. She says, you know, I like to slay a little bit. I love to give a little slay. It's almost like a different person in mm -hmm. a way because she, she it's like she loves that the glam the fun the the fashion the art i think she's an artist so she loves making art with her body and her hair and her mind and with a look and then the young woman that i see on sets she's so casual so chill so open we talk about photography we talk about so many things i don't even know our conversations go all over the map she's very mm -hmm. interested and interesting which is something I can't say about a lot of young <laughs> artists. You know, I feel like a lot of people don't know themselves. And I would really just say she's surrounded by a really great family. I know her mother, Claire. We've known each other since our California Shakespeare Theater days. And actually, mm. that's where I met Zendaya when she was five years old. Oh. Um, she she was a, a young girl who was who kept coming to see this Shakespeare production. And we found out that she, one of the productions she loved the most was a production of All's Well That Ends Well, where I played the clown. And I remember playing with her like three different times because my job was to sort of play with the audience. And then we realized that that was, that's our first, that's our connective tissue that we first mm -hmm. met that long ago, uh, <laughs> you know, when she was about five or six years old. So I think that we, there's something energetic, there's something cosmic that we're now working together so closely uh, that was all already deemed and set up in the stars. And I think she just loves her family and her close friends. And she's, um, and I think it shows in her work that she cares about people. Mm -hmm. And then the, the season ends with, with Rue trying to make amends to people that she's wronged, including Ali. And there's just a heartbreaking scene where she, she calls Ali on the, on the phone. And I understand that that was shot in kind of an unusual way that like you were like even though it's a phone call you were in the room together yeah. when you were shooting that scene yeah i think sam thought that was very important that it felt like we were truly having this conversation i, I can see it right now zendaya standing across from me across the room and i'm on the other end of the room and uh we looked at each other and said the lines i just wanted to call you and tell you that i'm sorry for what i said um and i really regret it uh, I just, I never should have said that. Rue. And I'm Rue. sorry. I'm sorry. Listen to me. I forgive you. And I know in particular, I remember Sam and I talked about that long pause that I take and said it's important. She, he, you know, he asked me, he would just ask me questions. Why do you forgive her? Do you forgive her? And I think that those are the questions that Ali had to ask himself before he gave an answer. And that's also part of his journey, which is uh, forgiveness. And, he, and I think that that's something ultimately that he's working on to make sure that even if someone has wronged him, to forgive them. I think ultimately Ali is a symbol for redemption mm -hmm. in our culture and in our world and what we're asking for, um, that everyone's human, that everyone has faults that everyone is suffering and struggling. But everyone, when they have accountability, there is and should be inroads for them to come back into good grace mm -hmm. just because they have been one way. And for Ali's case and, and for Rue's case, they've been suffering from the disease of addiction. 
everyone has an opportunity to grow and come back into society and function, whether it's people who have been incarcerated or people who have wronged people because of their um, their disease of addiction, uh, whether people have, you know, been quote unquote canceled in society. I think it's an examination of all of that, of raising the questions. Why do we do that? Why is it important for people to do that? And then is that human? He asks a lot of questions. I don't know in particular if he's trying to get answers, but I think mm-hmm. that he's very interested in the question. And that's what I love. And I think that ultimately that is, um, that is our showrunner's questions about our humanity and who are we and who are we going to become. But then why, why does Ali keep, keep forgiving Rue? Because it's human. I think, I think ultimately because it's human and because he's also asking for forgiveness himself. Ultimately, I think people are a bit selfish. Hmm. He's not just doing it for her. He's doing it for himself. If he's able to forgive her, perhaps the world will forgive him. His, his children will forgive him. His wife will forgive him. He can also forgive himself, possibly. And there's such a wonderful moment as well when Ali kind of helps to orchestrate this this family dinner for Rue and her mother and her, her sister. Better question is, uh, what are you doing right now? Nothing. Want to help me cook? Oh, I can help. Nah, nah. You keep your stank. <laughs> Withdraw diarrhea ass on the way from my food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to tell no, me about that? No, her? I think no, you should. No, 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 no. <laughs> and it like it seems like I, I guess is he do, for you? He's like working his own way back into the world a little bit. He's working his way maybe into this family. Maybe there's a little something going on with the mother there. Like what? What for you was kind of happening in that in that dinner scene? It's funny. I, I joked with Nika. <laughs> a few times saying, ooh, you know, here I come. Ali's coming in the house now. He sees this fine woman here, you know, what's on his mind. Of course, he recognizes that Nika, Nika King is not only a beautiful woman, but also a, an extraordinary actress. Mm-hmm. And um, so he comes in, he likes to vibe there. But I think it's more than that. I do believe that he's coming in, he's got to know Ruth so much, and he knows that they've been lacking sort of that, that father figure, that male figure in the house that I think that he believes, you know, I, I'm sure he knows and believes the way I do that Nika King is very strong and capable and, and has been doing it, has been doing it on her own for a while since Rue's uh, father's passing. And she's very strong, but also she needs support. Not believing, you know, oh, she needs the support of a man, but she could just offer, he could offer up some support to the family. So now that he's gotten Rue, I think that he's, coming into the the fold because I think he's like, maybe I can have a conversation that someone else may not be having with her younger sister mm-hmm. or with the mother. I could just be that one, you know, Ali is capable to be that one at the dining room table saying, offering up some other ways to think, you know, because, you know, a family, if you don't have an outsider sometimes with perspective, you guys are just, you know, suffering in the same traps and tropes and, and you're just caught up in it. You're caught mm-hmm. up in the same anger, you're caught up in the same feelings, and you may need another perspective. And I, I know that I believe that that's what he's offering when he comes into the house to make dinner. He's offering mm-hmm. some levity. He's offering a simple meal, probably something they haven't even had. You know, he's Sam and I talked about him coming in to make lamb. For my money, not only it was something that's, you know, halal, but it's also something that I believe um, is unexpected to watch this tall brother, very ordinary brother, making lamb. So we want Mm -hmm. to make decisions like that. So he makes a nice Mediterranean meal, and he just offers up some conversation and some perspective. And I think he believed that he was serving his purpose for that evening, and that was Mm -hmm. it. Can you give us a hint of any any of what uh, is to come? Like, what would you hope to see happen for him in season three? I think, it's funny, after that special episode, Sam and I had a great conversation about how often Ali can can give these long monologues mm-hmm. and and where's the end to that and I, we 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 wouldn't want him to quote unquote be the magical negro that's a <laughs> you know coming in or like Yoda 
You know what I mean? Like no one wants that yeah. as a character. You know, you can only do that so often. You have to transform and evolve. And I think that not that let's say that he was a magical Negro or Yoda, but I'm just saying you don't want that to become his story. And we're very conscious of that. So I know that it's important to, to take him out into spaces and to understand that he is uh, a recovering addict. And I don't know how much that plays. I, I don't know. Cause I feel like with, Anyone who's in recovery, it's like, you know, we have our main protagonist, Rue, who is very much um, an untrustworthy narrator. Mm -hmm. And people have put so much trust and faith in Ali. And I think they're also forgetting that he's a bit of an untrustworthy narrator as well. Mm. So I think there's something interesting about that. More with Coleman Domingo after the break. If you're enjoying this interview and want to keep up with future episodes, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Envelope and my conversation with Coleman Domingo, who's nominated this year for Best Guest Actor in a Drama Series for his role in Euphoria. But before we all knew him as Ali, there was a moment where he didn't think acting was going to work out. Let's dive back in. To step back a little bit, I've heard you say that there there was a moment even after all those years of working in the a theater and as you it seemed like your career was taking some steps forward that there was a moment I think it was around 2015 or so where you were thinking about leaving the the business. I think you had a, a side business as a photographer and you wow. I'm just so curious like why why at that moment was it you were going to maybe finally pack it in and what kept you going? Mark, man, you've done your research, man. <laughs> Let me tell you, I was ready to leave this business, and um, and I really meant it. You know, I know people may say it, but they don't mean it. But I really meant it. I was making steps to do something else because I thought that I had reached um, the apex of my career with certain successes. I had went off to London to do a musical called The Scottsboro Boys. I was nominated for a Tony and an Olivier. You name it. And I would come back to New York when I lived in New York, and I felt like I was always starting over. Hmm. I was trying to expand, and I felt like there were many systems in New York that were trying to keep me in the same position, mm -hmm. maybe keep me a little smaller in some way. I didn't feel that I was being challenged by the auditions that I had. or Many things weren't in place properly, and so I was really on my way out. I, I, I asked my partner, I said, Do you, I've been doing headshots as a side hustle for many years. And I, I thought about, you know, investing in a photography studio and just continuing to do that and changing my life. I thought that I did everything I was supposed to do. Once you do a musical like the Scottsboro Boys and a musical like Passing Strange and some really profound work. I, and I think just before that, I did the movie Selma. I thought, I think this is the best that I can do. Mm. <laughs> And also, you know, I was in my mid 40s, late 40s, like 47. And I thought, I'm still living in a rent stabilized apartment and never having any savings, always trying to get caught up. You know, meanwhile, my friends are doctors and attorneys and they made other life decisions and they're having things that you, you want. And it's OK. After a while, you're like, I want these things. And as an artist, I feel like I, I could never attain them. So I was going to pivot. And then. Before I did that, I actually let go of an agent and a manager, and I was really cleaning house. And then one of my dearest friends um, introduced me to two men who really changed my career. Actually, there's a few people who've changed my career, and that's Brian Liebman and Corey Richmond, who are my managers still to this day, and my agent, Elizabeth Wiedersheim, and Kate Naven. They came on board, and they believed in what I that I had much more to give. Hmm. And they really set up the infrastructure for that to happen. And one of the first auditions they set up for me was for a, sh a show called Fear the Walking Dead. And I thought, these people have lost their mind. I, I don't know who they are and who they, who they think I am, but I wouldn't do something like that. It's a genre show. That's not me. But then I read the script, and the, the, I loved the character so much, and it was something I'd never done. And it was a self-tape audition. And I got a call two days later from a self-tape uh, for an offer for that show. 
and it, it changed my career. It gave me um, more stability. It gave me a place to really create. And, uh, and again, a, a place to create in the television space where I felt like there was no room for me, but it was a character that was so complex and I, it was like Shakespeare. And so um, that sort of rejuvenated my career and then other things started to follow. I think that also my heart shifted, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think that I was started to carry a little possible bitterness and not getting the opportunities, not getting up to bat for these auditions and these roles. And I didn't want that because I loved this work so much. I didn't want to be bitter. And I felt like that that was coming. And I was becoming very dis- disheartened in this industry. And, um, and uh, things changed. There's something so interesting to me in the fact that you've been in so many filmed adaptations of theater pieces. I'm thinking of The Color Purple, Ma Rainey, going back to Passing Strange. And I'm wondering why, what you think of that. Like, why do you think you keep ending up in those pieces? It's funny. I would say that that and I think that, I, I, and I say this without any ego, I'm like, I think I've been in some of the most seminal works of film about the African American experience in the last ten years, I've been in them, and I'm like, and I'm like, what's the connective tissue there? And I think it's because I'm very curious about history. Um, I think that I do come from a theatrical background, so I understand when we're doing something a theatrical adaptation. I know how to, how it should live and crackle and give it a bit more size. Mm-hmm. I'm not afraid of a long scene. Of, a, of extensive monologues. Those are actually in my wheelhouse. So I know when I see an adaptation, I'm like, oh, you want somebody to deliver three pages of dialogue? You got your man. <laughs> so I think that, you know, it calls on everything that I'm curious about in my skill level. I think that's why I'm in all these like adaptations, but also, and then the histories, I think because I'm big, again, like I say, I'm a huge nerd and I'm very curious about history and then how we create this history and adapt it for film and television and theater. Mm -hmm. And I want to be sure to ask you about uh, Ma Rainey in particular in that that film has taken on such a gravity because of the fact that it ended up being Chadwick Boseman's last role and simply being the adaptation of the play that it was, this fantastic work by August Wilson, it already was going to be like a heavy, intense piece. Like for you, like how has that movie and that experience changed? Like given what happened with Chadwick and the way that that movie kind of was received by the audience when it, when it came out. Wow. The way we created that film felt like we were in a bit of a bubble. Mm -hmm. It was small and intimate. And we all come from the theater, everyone who was in there, most of us do. And um, the thing that I could say about it is that we were creating something so intimate and about us as Black people in America. Um, that's what August Wilson's work is. August Wilson's, if you get the opportunity and the privilege to speak August Wilson's language, there's no, there's none other is calling on everything, not only that you can bring as an artist, but also how you can pull and bring your ancestors in. It's really some of the greatest work. And maybe I'm still processing it, that we went through this whole experience, especially in the middle of the pandemic, where I had to recognize that we didn't even have like a proper sort of like um, exhibit of it. We were still in our silos at home. Mm-hmm. And we'd never sort of like released it in a way. It felt like it got out there in the world, but you didn't feel what people were feeling. You didn't, it wasn't that exchange, especially mm-hmm. that you were looking forward to creating something that was, had origins in the theater. You were looking for, how does this play out there? How do you feel and receive these words and what we're telling as a company? It still breaks my heart that um, my friend Chad wasn't with us to the finish line mm-hmm. of getting this film out into the world. Uh, his, his, his life had other plans. Um, but I think it's very poignant and I'm very, I don't know, I guess the word is privileged to have been mm-hmm. a part of this final gift 
that uh, Chad's spirit put out into the world. Mm -hmm. I feel very privileged um, in every single way that, I mean, I feel like, I mean, to that, what a note to end on that that's yeah. your last film and it's a seminal performance. It is a, a seminal work. I believe everyone is doing their very best work in that film. And um, I know it's a film that I think I hope will be taught in classes. Yeah. And it's still, it's a, it's still very bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Even saying that, you know, I've, I've heard you say that you want to have a career that has the range of someone like Daniel Day Lewis or Christian Bale or Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I'm wondering what it is that you admire about them. And for you as a black actor, do you feel that you're simply not given the opportunities to exhibit that same kind of range? You know what? The thing is, I think that I have honestly sort of like fought for those opportunities and I've held space for those opportunities. That's why my career looks very different than my peers. Hmm. It's like I play in very different playgrounds all the time. And so, and I know I go for the thing that's probably not the most expected, but also know that that's something I've crafted. I've been very conscious of that. I, there's a lot of things I check off of a, uh, a checklist in a way of mm -hmm. what I believe is important for me when I take on a role. I'm like, yeah, when people say, what kind of Career you would do you admire? You know, one of Philip Seymour Hoffman's, where he was just such an incredible thinker and shapeshifter. You know, I, I admire the Willem Dafoe's. I admire, uh, you know, someone that people don't usually think of as a character actor, which is Harry Belafonte Jr. He was very mm -hmm. much that character actor wrapped in a leading man's body. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, that one of my favorite things of his is when he played Geechee Dan and Uptown Saturday Night. He's mm -hmm. phenomenal, man. He's phenomenal. And so I'm always telling people, watch that man. You may think of him as you know, Mr. Calypso Man and Mr. Beautiful Leading Man, but he's got so much more. And I've been I've been very careful in making sure that I'm not um, playing into tropes and playing into what people believe that the only things I should play, you mm -hmm. know? Do you feel like part of that has been the opportunities that you've had to work with black directors like Janixa Bravo or Ava DuVernay, Barry Jenkins or Blitz Bazawulye, who's doing The Color Purple? Have they been able to give you opportunities that maybe you hadn't previously gotten in Hollywood? I would say yes. I would say yes, absolutely. I think because the, the men that I'm able to create are very complex men in many ways. Um, that's the thing that I love the most. And I would also say when I've worked with, you know, Steven Soderbergh on the neck and also with Steven Spielberg, they also offer me opportunities to give a complexity to these black men that I'm creating. Mm -hmm. The beautiful things, they always want to hear what I have to say. And, and they know it's important for me uh, to create someone that I'm proud of. And they don't always have to be heroes at all either. I like to play dirty, rotten scoundrels. <laughs> And I've been, I've been, I guess I've been playing a bunch of them lately. I feel like I've been a, I've been on a bender, like whether it's <laughs> Candyman and Zola and like, you know, just like, and, and Mister and the Color Purple. But then I like, I, I always mix it up. I think a smart director will know this about me. If you're like, oh, I've got to get Coleman because I've seen him play this role before and you want to offer me sort of the same version of it, you, you should know I'm not the one for you. You want me to create something brand new using the, the skill set that I have, the body that I have, which I believe I'm a shapeshifter. I like to, I like when people meet me, they're like, oh, I thought you were older. I thought you were shorter. I thought you were younger. I thought you were older. How old are you? You know, <laughs> I thought your hairline was back here. I thought it was for that. You know, you know, the people are like, they always think that I look different because I'm like, yeah, because I'm a character actor. I make decisions about everything, you know, whether the kind of weight that I have put on for a character. And, you know, the, the, the wildest thing is I think it's because so many of my, my peers aren't given the opportunity to do just so, mm -hmm. you know, or they don't give themselves the opportunity to say no and move into a different direction. You know, I know that that's something that I hold true for myself. And part of my practice as an artist is to constantly challenge myself and challenge audiences, challenge rooms that I'm in. Um, and I think that's the way we create some really cool work, you know? Mm hmm and then I want to be sure to ask about your TV show, Bottomless Brunch at Coleman's, where you remotely interview some of your friends over a cocktail from the comfort of your homes. Is that a show that you're going to be able to continue doing? You know what? We just put a cap on Bottomless Brunch at Coleman's, but 
we only did that because the show is transforming into another show. Um, I guess I can say it uh, because we've got the green light from AMC that we're going to do a linear platform, streaming platform, digital platform show that is sort of an, it's another step in the evolution of Bottomless Brunch, which mm -hmm. is called You Are Here. I can't wait to see that. That's great. Wow. Reflecting back, what what has it come to mean to you to know that you've achieved success now, even greater than you had before, and that, you know, from that moment of kind of doubt and darkness, you've gotten somewhere you maybe couldn't even imagine for yourself at that time? When I lived in San Francisco many years ago, I went, I'm not a religious person, but I'm quite spiritual. I went to this church once and I heard this pastor say that anything that you give your life to has to work out for you, but you have to believe it the first time. And I always thought about that. And I knew that at times I would, I lost faith, but then I would get back up and I would find my way again. And then I started to really just believe that thought, I think, and just believe that it's always there for me. It's always available, like love. I've always believed that love was available. So why don't I believe, and it was, so why don't I believe that the career that I'm seeking and the work that I'm seeking is always seeking me? And so that's something that I, I truly believe that once I believe that, it actually started to transform. And I feel very lucky and blessed that I've been working Pretty consistently, even in those dark times, I've been working. It took a moment because people always wanted me to just say, oh, I'm just an actor or director or writer. And I've defied that for many years. And now people understand that I do all of these things. And that's an awesome thing. And now that I even have my own production company, I, I continue to define and redefine myself in this industry. And people accept that. I, I've never been somebody who could just put into a box. And I'm very grateful for that. I feel like I've actively made sure that I was never just perceived as just with my abilities of the way I looked or my sexuality or, you know, or, or my political beliefs, you name it. I've always wanted to be seen as an actor and someone who's malleable and interested in telling stories. And I do believe that we've, the industry and I, we've met each other in such a um, loving, generous way. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it seems like it's continuing. I'm very happy. The Envelope is a Los Angeles Times production in association with Neon Hum Media. It is produced by Navani Otero and edited by Lauren Robb and Hiba Ellerbani. Sound design and mixing by Scott Somerville. Neon Hum's production manager is Samantha Allison, and their executive producer is Shara Morris. Special thanks to Matt Brennan, Jasmine Aguilera, Shawnee Hilton, Elena Howe, Kayla Bell, Patricia Gardner, Dylan Harris, Brandon Sides, Lauren Rocha, Amy Wong, and Chris Price. Till next time, I'm your host, Yvonne Villarreal. And I'm Mark Olson. Join us next week for our very last episode of the season. You won't want to miss it. See you then.